Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 226, featuring part two of my interview with Mr. Glenn Wickman, the co-creator of Rogue, one of the most important computer games of all time. This part of the interview, we talk more about Rogue, including the commercial release by Epix. Then we get in his later projects, including a couple of shareware games for the Macintosh that I think you'll find very interesting. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Glenn Wickman. So after this, after you got the game finished, uh, were you sort of the big man on campus where all these people coming up to you and say, oh, wow, look, he's the guy that did Rogue, or, <laughs> you know, one of those Rogue guys. I mean, <laughs> did you have, have a measure of fame from this? Yeah, the, the fame part was interesting because it, it uh, came and went and, and then came again. But when I was, uh, you know, I, I remember going into a, a software store, you know, once we had the commercial version and, and seeing it on the shelves and, you know, going, oh, there's my game. And, and then one of the uh, um, people who worked at the store came up and went, wow, that, that's your game? And so, Why didn't you show up in a limo? <laughs> you know, so there were, uh, um, so yeah, there was um, a measure of fame uh, on campus, I mean, among the people who were there and writing games, uh, you know, I, Michael and I were, we had what everybody I think agreed was, was the coolest game uh, at that point. So that was, that was fun. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, as time went on and uh, all of that faded and there came a point where, uh, like I, I didn't even have it on my resume anymore because nobody had heard of it. So <laughs> there wasn't any reason to have it on there. Um, and then starting maybe just, just a few years back, all of a sudden everybody had heard of it again. And uh, it took me a while to figure that out. And I, I think I've at least got a theory as to what happened there. But, uh, but uh, that, it's been fun to sort of have a little bit of a resurgence of that after low these many years. Okay, then let's hear the theory. So my theory is that it's um, you know when I was when I was in college, there were no game design courses. Right? They just didn't exist as as a discipline. And uh, now I'm realizing that there are all of these colleges that are teaching computer game design and history of computer games. And uh, so you know, people who are my age have heard of me because they played Rogue in college and, and people who are in, like in their 20s, they learned about it in college. And, uh, but there's this sort of gap in between of <laughs> people who have never heard of uh, Rogue. And, uh, but, they get to, but they've heard of Mavis Speak and Teaches Typing, so I get to be famous for that one for them. Oh, you're serious? You're... <laughs> I mean, not, not, not to knock the typing thing, but really people know you more for that than for Rogue? Well, people of the age, yeah. How did it end up being distributed with BSD Unix? Uh, well, that was because uh, of Ken Arnold and, and Michael being at Berkeley. Um, they, you know, that department got to decide what went on BSD Unix and... Uh, they put Rogue on, and uh, uh, it ended up being um, a program that kind of exercised most of the f facilities that you needed to make sure that your uh, your installation was correct. So it was kind of the thing is you would install BSD Unix, and then if you could play Rogue, you knew that you had your installation had been good. Uh, so. I guess that was the excuse for why it was there. Yeah, that's all. It just seems so awesome to me to you know to have a game so good that they actually include it with the <laughs> operating system. Uh, so, how did this deal with Epics uh, come about? Um, well, it was we kind of knew people. We knew people who worked at Epics. Uh, there was a guy named Scott Nelson who was one of the guys who hung out at the Stat Lab, and. Um, he worked for Epics and he got us introduced to people there. So that was, um, that was Michael and John who made that deal. I wasn't really involved in it. So I don't know the details. Initially 
we actually had Michael and John created a company called AI Design, um, which stood for Anything Interesting Design. It was, uh, and, and so we initially had a boxed version of Rogue that we were trying to sell ourselves. We as do you still have any of those box copies? No, I don't. But I bet Michael does. Um, or those have to be some pretty serious collector's items. Yeah, yeah. That's a. I'll, I'll ask Michael about it. Um, yeah, I've I've got um, one of the Epix boxes still, but I don't have any of the original AI design ones. Um, so yeah, at some point, uh, you know, they were uh, producing it in John's garage and shrink wrapping it themselves and shipping it off to stores, and then uh, decided that that was not scalable and so we we made the deal with epics and then epics so at that point we had the pc version and that was the only version that we had and epics uh paid for us to do versions for uh macintosh initially and then later uh, atari st and amiga and coco but strangely those versions didn't really sell that well right the Ones for personal computers. I was wondering why you what your thoughts are on that. It's just bad marketing or, or what? Um, yeah, it, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, you know, it, there was a point, and I, I think you mentioned this in in your book, and I think Richard Garriott shot down the the idea that it was it was piracy because um, obviously there there were games created at the same time that did do well commercially. Um, but ultimately, Epic's, you know, the whole company ended up failing. And so I think piracy was a big problem in the industry. Um, I think uh, that, you know, Rogue was massively popular on Unix computers. Uh, you know, we, it, was, it became fairly famous in that, you know, very academic circle of uh, people who played games on college computers. Um, but it, I guess it didn't just, it, it seemed natural to us that, you know, it was just going to therefore be a massive seller commercially. We, we thought we'd make a ton of money off of it. Um, but, uh, how much money did you actually make off of it? Personally, I made $15,000 and that was the, uh, the advance on royalties for doing the Atari ST uh, port. Uh, so that's, that was the only thing that I was ever paid money for. Um, oh, and plus I got a, a Macintosh. Um, <laughs> so Michael and John paid me, I did the, uh, uh, for the, when we did the Mac version, that was the first one that we did that actually had gra tile graphics instead of characters. So I created all of the tile graphics for the Mac version. Um, and my payment for that was I got to keep the Mac that they let me use to create the tiles. Um, Probably more significant than people may realize because those Macintoshes back then were, I guess, about the equivalent of five or $6,000 to today, right? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was used, but, <laughs> and it was a skinny Mac, 128K of memory, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was actually probably my first computer that I, that I actually personally owned and didn't have to share with anybody. So it was a big deal. One of the things I remember reading about this Epix release was that, you know, at the same time that came out, there had already been shareware or public domain versions of Rogue uh, that had to compete with. Uh, is there any truth to that? I don't know. Whether there were on on the PC, there probably were. Um, you know, the uh, there were certainly um, you know uh, games like it. There were already roguelikes at that point. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think a lot of the people who wanted to play rogue, they could just play NetHack or whatever um, at college, so they didn't have a, a need to have it on their PC. So you brought up the topic of roguelikes. 
Uh, so what did, you know, when did these things uh, first start popping up and what were your, your thoughts on them? You know, this was a thing that I think by the time I became aware of it, it was all, it had already been a phenomenon for quite some time. So I kind of was, you know, out of the picture for a long time. And um, the first thing that, that I had heard about was somehow came across um, the seven day roguelike challenge. And I, I don't remember even how I came across that. So that was, you know, that was only a few years ago, less than 10 years ago. Um, and I mean, I, I knew about hack and net hack and, uh, you know, some of these other things that were roguelikes, but I, I didn't, I hadn't heard the term. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I think it's, it's really cool that, that they got to get, ended up getting named after our game. And I think that's appropriate. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people have created a lot of really neat innovations and I feel blessed to have kind of been one of the people who got that ball rolling. On a related note, have you done some of your own roguelikes? Um, well, I did the seven day roguelike challenge once a few uh, years ago. I, I did a JavaScript roguelike uh, called the seven day quest. And uh, it had uh, seven environments and seven amulets. And so I, I did the whole thing based on this idea of seven. Um, and, and that was pretty fun. Did you win the challenge? Yeah. So yes, I succeeded. So, uh, you know, at, at that point it was only, they weren't judging which one was best. It was just, you, you either had something playable in seven days or you didn't. And, uh, and I did, and I felt really good about it because I really did start completely from scratch, no existing libraries or game engines or anything like that. And, um, you know, I came up with the story and all of the graphics and all of the code, uh, and I was working full time at the time, so uh, really did not have anything like 134 hours to, to do it in, but I, I managed to get it done, so. You ever thought about doing one uh, based on the Bible? No, that's, that's. I don't know why I haven't thought about that. I've I've read the Bible, um, and it's, there's a lot of interesting uh, stories and adventures in there. But I have have not thought about that. Um, but that's a good idea. Okay, so I have a question here from uh, Maximilian Dimethyltryptamine. Believes how you pronounce that. He says, "I want to know if if uh, Glenn has any current favorite roguelikes that he likes to play." P.S. My current favorite is Infra Arcana. Well, yeah, I, I have. Uh, shoot, now I need to remember the name of it. I actually just uh, judged a roguelike contest, and uh, there was uh, so yeah. Back, we'll go back at some point at the end, and I'll I'll tell you the name of it um, and where to get it. But it was uh, a very fun, quick little thing that uh, is uh, sort of roguelike. It doesn't have a lot of exploration to it. You just you, but it it's uh, it's got a lot of. Um, kind of the good visceral feel of a roguelike and very simple to just sit down and play it for a while and win or lose. So, All right, so I got a question here from Shane Stacks, and I think this might be a, a joke question, but, uh, you know, go ahead and throw it out there and you can <laughs> decide for yourself. So he says, ask him if he's ever going to let Rogue and Gambit smooch. <laughs> it's fine with me. Okay, so Di uh, Diablo, and a lot of people say that's a roguelike. Now, I looked at an older interview you did back in 07. You said you'd never even played the game. Uh, has that changed? And, you know, if so, what, do you agree that it is a roguelike? I, I still have not played Diablo, but I, I am much more familiar with it because of uh, David Craddock's 
um, sit a while and listen book, which um, I read. Um, and that got me to at least watch some uh, YouTube videos of Diablo. Um, I don't have uh, a PC and Diablo one is last I knew not available for the Mac. So uh, I haven't played it. Um, I, I suppose I could go out and get Diablo three, uh, but from everything that I've <laughs> yeah, read. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in playing uh, Diablo at least one and, and maybe two at some point that's still on my list of things to do, but at least some, uh, some videos, uh, some walkthroughs of it. So uh, yes, I, and it's, it's certainly, um, you know, I think it's well documented at this point in David Craddock's book that, that Rogue was at least one of the big inspirations for Diablo. So, and again, there's uh, the, the Matt Houtholder connection is that he was um, the producer of Rogue at Epics and, uh, and then was also involved in Diablo. I think it's true for me and probably for a lot of the uh, the viewers here that you're better off playing Rogue than Diablo 3. But uh, but anyway, let's uh, uh, move on to uh, Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. You know, that's a surprisingly popular game, you know, given the, the subject matter, I think. And you can just sort of tell me what was the, you know, how this game came about and then why you think it had such a great reception. Um, okay, so... I guess, you know, is it even fair to call it a game? I think so. Um, I, I mean, if, if it had games in it, um, and you know, there was the racing game inside Mavis Beacon, and uh, and I had a lot of uh, input into the design of that game. Um, I was the one who dis who pushed for making it first person with a rearview mirror um, rather than kind of like an overhead view. So. You know, if you're typing faster than the pace car, then you see the pace car in your rearview mirror. And if you slow down, then you see the pace car ahead of you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, how that came about was uh, AI design. I, I, ke I kept working for AI design, which then later became called Highland Software, so Michael and John's company. Uh, but they were doing contract work and working on a Microsoft bookshelf and various things. And I said, are we going to do any more games? And they said, well, no. <laughs> games didn't work out too well for us. We're going to do these other things that are making money. And uh, so uh, I started looking for someplace I could do games. So I moved down to LA, started working for Software Toolworks, um, came to do Mavis Speak. And again, they already had a PC version. I worked on the Apple IIGS version. Um, but uh, I, uh, I did get to have a lot of design input in there. One of the things that I'm proud of there was the, the translucent hands over the keyboard. Um, they, again, they, their initial design just had kind of this diagram where a finger would stretch out to hit the right key. And I said, no, we should, we should do this. And, and then I got my manager really mad at me because I spent about three days taking pictures of hands and drawing hands. It's like, we've already got an artist. You're here to write code. And, but by the time I was done showing them, this is how it should work. And I said, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. So, um, so, you know, I think that was part of what made it successful. I, I have no idea what makes things win and what makes things lose. I've seen all sorts of great things do poorly and poor things do great. So I, you know, Either I have no good judgment or the rest of the world has no good judgment or both. I know you've done some Mac games, uh, Toxic Ravine and is it Mombasa? Mombasa. Kind of wonder if you could tell me about those games, but also just in general, what, what, what appeals to you so much about the Mac? Um, well, yeah, so I... I just ended up being a Mac guy uh, for a long time. That was in a position to be one of those people. And uh, so, you know, I thought the Mac was going to win. I actually really liked the Atari ST. Um, and if that had won, I'd have, I'd have loved to have kept uh, 
working on that, um, even though it was cheesy in a lot of ways. Uh, I had a certain affection for it after having done, done the road port for that. Um, but anyway, I ended up with a Macintosh. That was, that was just the computer that I owned. And uh, so in the late 80s, you know, soft game software was really transitioning from uh, a thing where a person could create a game, which to, uh, you know, something where you had to spend a million dollars and have dozens of people. And uh, so I did some shareware. Uh, well, there were shareware around. And I wanted to sort of test out the theory uh, that I was wishing was true, right? That uh, there was shareware, but it was mostly really amateurish stuff. And then there was commercial software that you needed a whole team of people to do. So um, there was a game, Mombasa was, was my one of many, many uh, shareware knockoffs of a game called Shanghai which was based on Mahjong. Um, and so there was a, a Mac shareware version of it called Gunshy, which I was playing and my wife was playing and, and we really liked it, but it, I thought, oh, I could do much better than this. And so uh, that was why I decided to do Mombasa and then just you know see how it would work as shareware. And Toxic Ravine was actually, there was a, an arcade game called Canyon Bomber that I used to pump quarters into. And uh, that was uh, in college at the same time that I was doing Rogue. I, I uh, did um, my knockoff of Canyon Bomber that ran on a dumb terminal, um, used the same curses library as Rogue did. And uh, so Toxic was and then you know I Canyon Bomber was really simple just all there was was rocks to blow up and then Toxic Ravine was me taking that idea and um, running with it and saying well what if every rock did something different when it got hit by a bomb and um, so uh, again there I was I had my Mac uh, and I uh, put that together to, to see, you know, so that was, I did all of the sound design, graphic design, game design, programming. There was uh, nobody else involved in Toxic Ravine aside from people playing it and giving me feedback. It was just purely my own thing and I wanted to see what I could do with that. So put it out there as shareware, probably got 50 people or so to write checks, but, uh, but one of them was Steve Wozniak, so I didn't cash that check. I have checks that signed Woz, and I thought, oh, I'm keeping this one. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, you know, why it was, it seemed like you'd be making a lot more than that, but I guess the, it wasn't a very large Mac Shareware community. I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, How did you do the Shareware part of it, by the way? Was it a, you get to play so long and then you pay, or is it just it was you it, to pay? It wasn't a Neuware in any way. It was just purely based on the honor system. It was, if you like this game, you know, write a check and put it in an envelope with a stamp and here's my address, uh, which was actually my parents' address <laughs> because <laughs> I was still moving around too much in those days. Um, so I didn't think that they, you know, the, the letters would find me. So... Uh, you know, it's, there wasn't anything like PayPal or things like that to kind of make it really easy to just click a button and, and donate. So, uh, oh, well, all those people out there that played Toxic Ravine and Mombasa, now's the chance to pay up, right? <laughs> uh, well, so I, uh, uh, I saw it. Oh, sorry, what? I say, yeah, that address isn't any good anymore. So, <laughs> So, so no. well, where can they send it? <laughs> they can PayPal you, right? Yeah, sure. I'm easy to find now. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I 
Should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Glenn Wickman. That'll probably be the uh, the final installment with him. I got a lot of great stuff to cover, including uh, stuff for uh, aspiring game designers. So uh, stay tuned. A lot of great stuff. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much. If you have supported me in my efforts to keep Matt Chat on on the air, uh, you probably know by now. I've set up this Patreon site really a lot of fun. A lot of you guys have already jumped on the, the bandwagon there. Uh, if you're donating via PayPal, if you want to continue that, fine. Uh, you know, of course, I appreciate that. But you might want to check out this Patreon stuff. Uh, there's going to be some special perks uh, for people who uh, support me on Patreon, including a members-only podcast. So I know you guys will enjoy that. And by the way, if you have ideas for the podcast or maybe you want to be uh, on the show uh, to chat with me, uh, let me know. Maybe we can set something up. A lot of that stuff is still in the uh, drawing board phase at the moment, so really happy uh, to hear all of your suggestions. And, and again, thank you very much. Now what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I've got a brew submitted by uh, a fan. Uh, this is a fan named Masochus. Uh, from Colorado Springs, a lovely place. He says, Dear Matt, enjoy the brew. As a return, ah, knew there'd be a catch. Uh, as a return, uh, thanks. Maybe one day you can do a retrospective on Dork Sun Shattered Hairdo. I think that uh, probably means uh, Dark Sun Shattered Lands, Shattered Lando Calrissian. Uh, anyway, I think I know what game he's talking about. Thanks. Well, thank you, Masochus. I've been wanting to look at Dork Sun uh, for quite a while now, so hopefully we'll have that as the next retrospective. But anyway, more importantly, let's check out that ale you submitted. All right, this one is, uh, what the, <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> oh my God, is this a fishnet for an ale bottle? I, you know, I think I can uh, put that on. I think uh, Elizabeth would really be turned on by that, you know. Hey, maybe I shouldn't be showing you guys this. So th thank you very much, Masochus. Uh, I don't really know where this thing has been. Uh, okay, what do we have here? Whoa, Laguni Lagunitas Hop Stupid Ale, brewed and bottled by the Lagunitas Lagunitas uh, Brewing Company from Petaluma, California. Alcohol, eight percent by volume, and a really lovely label on this. Um, one pint, six fluid ounces. Well, there's a whole paragraph of text back here. Uh, give it to Mikey. He'll drink anything. Up the bomber went in toast, then to his lips, and what happened next could have been, could not have been for <laughs> a hop stupid. A slick reanimator green fluid oozed from the bottle. I love that movie, a uh, reanimator. Anyway, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. That's a fun story, though. Uh, let's see what else we can find out about this. 8% alcohol by volume. Uh, 102 IBU for you. Oh, they even have the pronunciation here. Lagunitas. Nope. Lagunitas. <laughs> Lagunitas. Lagunitas. You know, I'm having enough trouble already and haven't even got the damn thing <laughs> open. Anyway, let's, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this hop stupid here in the rather sexy drinking horn. I don't know if you can see this, but I found a use for a masochist's, a masochist's a little fishnet holder thing. Uh, it's quite svelte. Anyway, let's give this a sniff. It smells kind of like leather chaps and maybe some chains. No, I'm just kidding. It's kind of, a, as I would expect, a lot of a hoppiness to this. Uh, with a name like Hop Stupid, you really would expect a really strong uh, aroma and presence of hops. I can definitely tell that from the, the scent of this thing. Very nice, though, not overpowering. It's uh, quite, quite refreshing, uh, smelling actually. But anyway, let's give it a taste. And I need to make a toast here uh, to Masochus, obviously, but also to Mr. Brian Fargo, who has uh, stepped forward to support the show in a really major and impressive way. So uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, but here's a toast to Mr. Brian Fargo. Mm. Wow, that's a really uh, vibrant one here. Got a lot of citrusy uh, flavors to this. Uh, it's very sort of peachy, uh, sort of peaches, uh, citrus. Uh, the bitterness, considering how hoppy it smells, I was expecting something really bitter, but 
Uh, not really getting any bitterness here. Maybe just a little, a little just, just enough. You know, it's just the right amount of bitterness to make this flavor more co uh, complex. Let me try it again. Yeah, just a, a really exquisite flavor on this. Um, just all those combinations of the bitterness and the citrusy flavors, uh, the hoppiness, it's, it's just very uh, perfectly blended here. A really good mix. Uh, no one flavor overpowers the other. Uh, it's just really, really nice. I think I could tell a Masticus here has really great taste when it comes to ales. I'm going to have to give this one more taste. Yeah, just, just really, really good stuff here. Maybe just a little bit of a little bit of lemon, a little bit of a maybe a slight sort of nutty taste, uh, but all in all, really, really excellent stuff. I'm going to go, of course, a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, hop stupid. If you're lucky enough to find this one, I definitely recommend you check it out. It's really good stuff. And thank you again, Masochist. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. <clears throat> And the quotation I found this week comes from Benjamin Disraeli. And it goes something like this. The greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. See you guys next week. I fart in your general direction.